in possible light. Well, uh, uh, I, I'd like to remind you that it was talking in the paper that this paper is uh, actually more concerned with the political category of the universal and interested uh, in it to find a rather uh, some philosophical aspect of fiction. So, well, uh, my paper is actually uh, divided into two parts. In the first part, uh, I'd like to uh, talk about fiction and its uh, spiritual connection to real tradition. And uh, in the second part, I'd like to uh, focus on the idea of universal and disposable life as a possible category. And uh, I'll use slides uh, to show the key points of my paper because I'll read out some paper and uh, I think you will also be able to follow what, what I'm going to say here. So uh, my first, uh, the first section begins. What is a fiction? I mean, uh, in general, uh, is there any ready to go definition of that? I'm not sure, isn't it, that was possible for Anna Fink to write a single definition in her text. In fact, my aim even is not to find fiction in its singularity. Rather, I begin with this very question because every time my encounter happens with the word fiction in her uh, book, I keep on wondering how to relate this to any philosophical and or theoretical object. I do this because uh, sometimes the ideas of fiction, uh, talking from the perspective of her book, are so much rhetorically placed uh, that it, it seems difficult for me to place its role in our everyday context and use it to explain things happening around us. Because uh, I'm, uh, I, I'd like to mention that disposable life, uh, my thesis is concerned, my thesis focus is actually concerned with disposable life. So while I was uh, going through the fiction, like uh, the book of uh, Anna Fink, I found that it's quite difficult to uh, uh, use the category as universal, because all it's a kind of unknown sound there. So that's why uh, I would like to take this book to reconsider the category. So the encounters uh, that Brings friction suggests are not at all universal. Neither are the particles rigidly located in any given something. Because universal is much more locally bound and built. Concentrating on what she describes as zones of awkward engagement, Frings treats universal as a sort of local knowledge that aspire to go beyond its locality. Uh, from that perspective, from that viewpoint, there is no universal in itself as such. Also, as uh, Singh said herself, the fictional encounters across difference is not the same everywhere. They go through different alterations in different situations. So to intellectually grasp such awkward, uneven, unpredictable, and uncertain encounters, I needed to look for a philosophical spring which is going to work as a fiction. In so doing, I found that fiction is in its spirit related to the Hegelian idea of negation, which refers to the process of moving from thesis to antithesis to synthesis. Actually, I found this hint in a review by Andrew Wilco. You'll find it. And uh, to this dialectic, which uh, as uh, suggested by Hegel, the conflict that I can, can call friction between thesis and antithesis gives rise to some kind of synthesis that I can call historical progress or even the progress of the universe. Also, I can try to view Hegelian synthesis as the aspiration of the universal, which is an important tool to study how universal travel across differences and differences, according to Sue. However, we must remember that the produced synthesis through the dialectic process is altogether different and thereby not at all derived. It is as if the whole gives meaning to its part. 
and vice versa. The process goes on. But if this Hegelian notion of negation is looked more carefully from up close, then we see that this blending or mix-up or the process of becoming is not at all a smooth process. I mean, it is resounding uh, the uh, concept of friction or this homogenic figure. Rather, the journey from synthesis to synthesis through the resisting encounter of antithesis in between is always already an uneven and a symmetrical process. It's not predictable what final result is going to appear, and does not contain, therefore, a teleological trend in between. Now let's face, uh, looking at friction as a marker of conflict and contradiction, or uneven encounters, it takes us to the main idea of Karl Marx's philosophy in which conflict is absolutely central to his thinking about history, about politics, and about change. And Marx has identified this conflict with the estrangement of labor, that is, the alienation of the worker from his or her <coughs> community. Marx says, the more a worker produces in this industrialized modern world, the more she or he gets in the value. He sees a friction in between the worker and the society, between the labor and its product, between the powerful and the powerless. So he located that friction and thinks that this friction or conflict or contradiction, whatever you say, is what leads to historical changes which are recurrent in the society. But just to make a point clear that anything unlike Marx has seen the engaged universal, that is the intercultural engagement, more as a twofold tool that can give movement to global power and simultaneously limit it. So it's like, it, it, it may be function both ways. And it is through such inherent duality that it allows the engaged universal to travel over place and time and to change and to be changed It should be mentioned that, that this, is, this is the issue and contact are not fixed. Hence, it is important to locate how these various engagements occur at different junctures of history, culture, and context. From the perspective, the idea of friction is transgressive that crosses boundaries and makes intercultural engagements possible. As for the duality, friction which makes global connecting powerful and effective can get simultaneously in the way of the smooth operation of global power, quoting from Anderson. What comes out then from this duality is the difference that can disrupt, causing everyday malfunction as well as unexpected catastrophes. In this way, friction totally refuses the lie that global power operates as a well-oiled machine. It means it is not structured, it is inherently asymmetrical. The same is true for grand narratives such as globalization, modernity, capitalism, and so on. So we do not need to think that global power is an organized category operating worldwide in the same manner. Rather, those who see the grand narratives such as capitalism, globalization, freedom, human rights, as a universal, moving in singular form and lin linearity, might introduce the traps of universal and cultural, uh, cultural specificity. This trap is the trap of modernity, uh, which tends to discover a unity and unified model within every single phenomenon, be it through definition or substitution. It is at this point fiction criticizes the tendency of modernity Enlightenment modernity and overall the colonial modernity and disrupts unified and successful stories of globalization, global power, capitalism, and so on. So, uh, after that, my second uh, section will begin where I would like to, um, uh, I mean, this is actually uh, the Anderson and try to see that how uh, this possibility uh, can universalized category and for what reason. Okay, so 
uh, my second uh, third speaking here. So this point of departure increased the linear understanding of globalization and capitalism in question. It is important because when concepts of disposability and the disposable line are used, most often they are used as unified categories. It means the idea of disposable life or the attempt to infuse the redundant population across the globe, irrespective of their difference into one categorical umbrella, reproduce a monolithic version of disposable. But we know that such monolithic categories does not exist, and that there is no homogeneous category of rapid population of disposable life. So the point I'm trying to make here is, if there is no universal in itself, as suggested by Kim, then in what category these people for whom there is no goodwill in society, and those who are either separated from the rest, and who somewhere in an enclosure are completely disposed of will be. If those disposable population whose numbers are increasing in this world, perhaps due to war, due to climate crisis, recession, gentrification of urban space, pandemic, and what not, if they are not, these people are not found the opportunity to identify and associate with the broad political category of identity. Will there be the possibility of any coalition platform for Dr. Don't you think we need to reimagine the institutionalized structure of the global power and its nexus in order to address this problem? On a serious note, we must think of the question because this problem of redundant population is a battle issue that we are going to control in the 21st century and in this Anthropocene era. We can call this problem a planetary crisis. If we try to look, we find that the idea of human cohabitation is becoming an impossible issue because the amount of uninhabitable land is increasing every single day globally. It is true that they are not happening in the same way everywhere. So it is not happening in the same way everywhere. It is better if we look at their construction separately and explore the changes that explain the obstacle to production of the disposable life on a structured setting. But my proposition here is to establish a coalition category that will universalize the conditions of this disposable population without thinking much of what differences and distances are there in between. This sounds like a diatrosiva strategic essentialism by which differences and distances can be omitted for the sake of greater political zone that is to disrupt the universal logic of the social. Disrupting this universal logic is important due to the obstructive reproduction of new multitudes, the depoliticized and deterritorialized their lives across the globe. These emergences of multitudes, on the other hand, cause the new divide, social divide, new apartheid, slums, and so on, that are leading to the prospect of sudden social explosion in today's world. This distressing speculation sounds much credible in the post-9-11 world, where the endless war against terror keeps on producing thousands and thousands of refugees, asylum seekers, and growing populations. Uh, Zizek suggests uh, that a new world is emerging, even though we are not aware of it. But he's hopeful that this new and technologically advanced world will be able to disrupt the construction of the logic of disposable life presented by modernism. It is 
like challenging the so-called idea of truth and life that we have in our mind. In another case, <coughs> Zizek has speculated that the economic progresses and technological advancements are gradually eroding the possibility to sustain the human population who have lost their home and cannot afford to feed themselves. Moreover, just to remind all of you that even capitalism, considering it as an organized and unified institution, unlike state, I'd like to say that even capitalism has changed its face. It is far more powerful than it was in the time of the Cold War. Also nowadays, one of the greatest wealth of capitalism is war, which is a vital ground that generates thousands and thousands of disposable lives who are devoid of any state, laws, and trust. I know that Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh and Afghan refugees are not the same. Their experiences and global interconnection are not at all on the same page. I believe that even though what happens in Syria and what happens in Kashmir are geopolitically and historically quite different, but what is important is to essentialize and universalize the condition of the disposable population, those who are the collateral casualties of modernity according to Vision Bowman. In such practice, there is a risk of reproducing the common trap of universality and particularity. But for the sake of creating a coalition politics by which minorities or a group of uh, disposable population can fight for their identity and for the sake of creating a space for intersectional understanding of disposability. I uh, believe a universalized and unified form of disposable life can be imagined and practiced.